And so it might seem a little bit obscure that I want to tell you this morning that I want to talk about the story of Jonah. It's a very interesting story. And when I saw that, that um, DVD set, which is made, um, an Australian company called Lost Sheep writes these fabulous children's stories and you can download them off the internet to tell us children's stories like that on PowerPoint. Um, when I saw that story, it made me think, you know, what really is the story of Jonah about? It starts off with an amazing big call to mission. And the story of Jonah is filled with very big things. And that first, first call that is put on Jonah's life is huge. Here is Jonah. He is a good Israelite man, a man of God. And he hears this message to go out and to take the message outside of himself, outside of his network in Israel, outside of the place where salvation happens to the Ninevites. And Jonah thinks, what am I going to do? I can't put them all back in the womb and bring them out as children of Abraham. I just, I can't comp comprehend this. I don't know how to make them all Israelites. And so he jumps on a boat and he goes in the absolute wrong direction. He goes completely away. He runs from this big call, this big request that God has put before him and goes in another direction. But God has an amazing way of reminding us of what he has put before us and the direction that he would have us go. And so we hear this interesting and almost miraculous st story of Jonah actually having such a big turnaround in his, own, in his own heart that he realises that he has gone in the wrong direction enough to say to the people on the ship, throw me in the water. I think that's a part of the story that we often miss because that's a, a fairly big confession on Jonah's part. He says, I am the reason for this trouble. I am the one that has caused this problem. And so they throw him into the water. I don't know if I had missed my calling, whether I would have as much courage as Jonah to say, yeah, it's me, throw me in the sea. Would you? Well, Jonah does. He says, yes, I confess that it is my sin that is putting everybody else at peril. So let's save this ship and separate it from me. It's a pretty big act of love on Jonah's part. A love for these men on the ship that he doesn't even know. And so God steps forward in his act of love and, in fact, his act of faith and provides a whale. And in the belly of the whale, we see quite an amazing prayer from Jonah. One of the reasons that I thought maybe talking about Jonah would be a good thing to do on prayer day. If you've got your Bibles there, open your Bibles with me to Jonah chapter 2. But I am going to spoil you today and I've put it up on the screen because it's such a beautiful prayer. And it's quite a long prayer and I think it's worth reading it all. It's Jonah chapter 2. Starting at verse 1, it says, And then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from inside the fish. He said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and, O oh Lord, you heard me. You threw me into the ocean depths, and I sank to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters, they engulfed me. Oh, 
When he called out to God, God did not take long to respond for salvation for Jonah. That God's grace and mercy was there just in the moment of his asking. And God's grace is about unwarranted favour. Did Jonah deserve the grace of God to save him from the belly of the, of the whale? Uh-uh. If I had an employee who I had given particularly clear instructions to about a set of tasks that I wanted completed and they went completely in the other direction, do you think I'd be very pleased? None of us would be. Those of us who manage staff or people any, at any time know that when you give instructions, you expect them to be followed to the extent of the instructions. And if the instructions are unclear, you expect them to come back to you for, for further instructions. Lucky, lucky God is not a manager who gets out his notebook and says, right, these instructions have not been followed through. Let me just write that down on a bit of paper here for you and offer that to you as a warning. He comes back with something that Jonah doesn't deserve, his life. He comes back with grace. And so jo finally Jonah goes to Nineveh. And he presents the message. He says to Nineveh, you are at the edge of your life. If you keep living in this state of lawlessness, in disrespect for each other and for other people who come into your community, then all else, I love that in the story, all else will happen. I'm sorry, consequences are going to befall on you. And in the Old Testament, they understood consequences to be you know, punishment, explosion, the end. But I imagine that Nineveh was doing a fairly good job of self-imploding by living the way that they were living. They were at the edge of their lives. And so when Jonah comes and says, God is calling you to a new way, a different way and a better way of life, Nineveh all of a sudden sees and understands and in that moment they repent. They do this most amazing turnaround. There is a religious revolution in Nineveh. Even the king himself, the story says, puts on his sorry clothes, which is his sackcloth and ashes. He physically acknowledges, even by the way that he dresses, that he has been living the wrong way. And he makes this amazing turnaround. And what is the distance to the grace of God when somebody repents? It's like that. And God pours down his grace on Nineveh. The people of Nineveh were not repenting just because the king was. There was a heartfelt change amongst the Ninevites. As a pastor reading that passage, I would just love to have that kind of success in an evangelistic campaign. Wouldn't you love it? To just walk down to the middle of the street of Whangarei and say, repent. If you keep going the way that you are going, the consequences will be beyond what you can bear. You are at the edge of your life. And everybody says, of course, Kylie, we didn't realise. You were speaking words from God. And the mayor puts on his sorry clothes. Wouldn't you be overjoyed? You should be. We would be all praising God. I got the privilege of spending three weeks down in Christchurch this, the, at the beginning of this year, in the beginning of February, in the Leo Shriven evangelistic campaign called Old Power. And I tell you, it was just an overjoying experience to see so many people coming in and hearing the message of God and wanting to change their lives. And... They had uh, 30 baptisms last weekend. They have a new church plant of 100 people. There are 30 little unchurched kids coming to the, to the children's program. And I was in the kids' program, and, and so I said to one of the mums that was coming, um, I said, how are you enjoying the program? Because her boys were just having a great time and they were really good. And um, she said, oh, I hope, I hope the boys have been okay. And I'm like, oh, they've been perfect. It turns out she was their aunt and caring for them. And I said, and, and, and the adult program? And she said, oh, it's wonderful. So I thought, you know, I'd just kind of try and deepen the conversation a little bit. And I said, are you enjoying the spiritual depth? And she said, no. And I was like, oh, I've said the wrong thing. It's not the right thing to say. You know, I'm not best at these evangelistic, you know, conversations. And she said, it's not spiritual depth, Kylie, it's reality. 
And I was like, okay. She said, everything that that man say, says is how it is. It's reality. And I tell you, my heart was overjoyed to see this lady's life changed. She'd seen through a dark glass and now she was seeing clearly. And you just wonder, why doesn't Jonah have that fervour? To see people's lives change, to see the success of his ministry, to see people coming into a new light and under the mercy of the grace of God. And Jonah spits his dummy. I confess that I preached this sermon last week in French Polynesia and the translator Nelly fell apart when I said that. She was like, what? It is a what? And I said, a dummy. And so I'm going like this and she says, a dummy? And I said, a pacifier? And then some people started speaking in French and she said, is this a lolly? <laughs> I said, no, when small children cry and they have a dummy in their mouth, it goes, Pah! and Jonah was behaving like a small child who had a dummy in his mouth who starts to be cranky and the dummy went, Pah! she says, this is Australian. <laughs> I also very unwisely, they said to me, do you want to preach on Friday night? And I said, look, I could preach till the cows come home. And they went, the what? I did realise at that point it probably wasn't wise to explain the intricacies of dairy farming <laughs> to my friends in French Polynesia who drink lots of New Zealand milk. But Jonah did, didn't he? One of the big things in the story of Jonah, for a man who had prayed so beautifully for the grace of God to fall on him, to pray like a small child. Puh! I knew it. God, this is why I didn't come, because you go off and you save people like the Ninevites. Why would you do that? He is angry at God because God is being merciful. And it's like he expects God to be more aggressive with the Ninevites or to, to call them to be in a higher standard? Or was there something in Jonah's heart who was expecting that God should only have poured out his grace and favour? on Israelites, that maybe that they were never going to be able to be literal blood relatives of Abraham, so should they have had God's grace. And we see the hardness of Jonah's heart. You know, there's a story that I came across a number of years ago that um, just sat on my heart for many years until I started studying the story of Jonah. Now, I've just realised that I could actually click this myself, hey? No? I'll click you on there to a map of Australia. Oh, there it is. There's my home country. I've been in New Zealand 18 months now, but that's where I belong. In 1786, the Brits didn't have... Uh, anywhere to put their less fortunate people of society who had, who had committed crimes. And they weren't uh, sending them to the Americas anymore, so for a long time they just left them in the belly of a ship. And when they decided that there was certainly a group of people that were not savoury enough to uh, be on the real British territory, they thought, where could we send the unsavoury of society? Let's send them to Australia. And in 1788, a ship full of convicts arrived at what we now see as Sydney, and a colony began there. But about five years later, there was some concern that that little tiny landmass um, down the bottom there might actually be taken by the French. And so uh, Governor Arthur Phillip thought, I know the answer. I have some even more unsavoury amongst our unsavoury convicts and so we will send them to this place that they called Van Diemen's Land. We will send them there and uh, we will um, start a, a new convict colony down there. And so that's what they did and now we are all English speaking and there's not a little French territory there on the bottom of Australia. 
And so he, uh, he, he made this colony and having sent some of the worst of the criminals and with um, little resources and a quiet deal of isolation, the convict camp that he made in Tasmania became a particularly unsavoury place. And a number of the prisoners were trying to escape, partly because of lack of food. They got lost in the bush, and this is not a very nice part of Australia's history, but apparently in trying to escape, they weren't able to find enough food, and so some of the convicts might have actually been eating each other. Those are the reports. Tasmania doesn't particularly have a great history. And so... Governor Arthur Phillip thought, I know, I will start a new fabulous fang dangle convict colony. And so, if we flick to the next slide, you will see the location of the place that he decided. He, he, he looked around and he f discovered just on that dot of Hobart there, if we flick yep, to the next slide, you'll see just where that dot of Hobart is that there's a peninsula. And there's a little bay in that, you know, a little cove in that peninsula and he thought, you know, that's the perfect spot to put a convict colony because it's easily guarded, you can only, you know, get to it by ocean at that stage and he put a convict colony there. So there's the best picture I could find of um, our governor, Arthur Phillip. And so they began um, Port Arthur. This was going to be the new amazing and modern prison. So uh, all the best methods, he decided that hard labour might not be the best method and he built a place for solitary confinement, which is uh, not a very nice thing to, to have people who weren't allowed to even hear any noise or have any contact with another human being. And so he in fact even made them wear slippers. So when they walked, no one else would even hear that there was not another person around. There's a photo of um, Port Arthur as it is today. It looks like a peaceful and tran tranquil kind of place. But its origins were quite a place of uh, negativity and violence. And you can see just up on the hill there that they built a church. There's um, just some broader pictures and, um, and on the next screen um, that as you sort of as you sailed into Port Arthur, that the first thing that you could see that was kind of up on a hill was this church to try and, as one of his methods of making this model prison, to try and show the convicts what that they were aspiring to. In the book Port Arthur, A Story of Strength and Courage by Margaret Scott, she, she tells the history of Port Arthur because um, she also tells the story of... Um, of what happened to Port Arthur in the 1990s. And this is what she says. She says, convicts brought in by ship look straight up the hill in front of them to the church as though their jailers were anxious to remind them that a just but stern God was watching their every action and the uphill road to him lay at their feet. Originally, the sea ran into a point much closer to the church than it does today. But gradually, the flat area at the foot of the slope was filled in and reclaimed so that a convict who had been released from Port Arthur and afterwards sent back for fresh offences would have found that with each backsliding, the path to grow God had grown a little bit longer. It's kind of an interesting imagery. The idea that this church was up on a hill in some way of showing that the convicts had to climb their way back up to God. And if they were ever going to be good enough to be released from Port Arthur, then they were going to have to climb their way. And in fact, there was even punishment when they got to the church if they didn't behave in the church exactly right. So if you were caught sitting when you were supposed to be standing, you got 55 days of hard labour. Or if you were caught whispering in church, you got 30 days. The imagery that the land mass was growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And so that convicts who were black backsliding, who had been released and then committed another crime and who came back to Port Arthur would see on their arrival as they sailed in on the ship that the distance to the church had got further and further and bigger and bigger. 
And I sat and I thought about that imagery for many years and it made me start to want ask this question. What is the distance to the church? Because Jonah thought the distance to the church should be much larger than it was. Do we make it complicated or difficult for people to get to the church? Is it this large climb that you have to claw through until you finally made it good enough? And once you get there, if you talk at the wrong spot or sit at the wrong moment, you get punished. Because it seems to me that the scripture says that the distance to God is a simple prayer. The Bible says that anybody who calls on the name of the Lord would be saved. Amen? We agree, do we agree with that? That the distance to God is one prayer away. That in our hour of need or our hour of darkness, in our hour of rebellion, that all we need to do is call on the name of the Lord and he is there for us, providing for our need. The uncomfortable part of prayer and the one that causes many discussions of, of long length into the night or during Sabbath school lessons is that God answers our prayer not for our comfort but for our need. And sometimes the way he answers those prayers seem to be obscure and strange. That sometimes he doesn't exactly answer them in the time frame that we would like or exactly how we would like him to answer them. But nonetheless, the scripture is clear and our experience is the same, that God's grace is there just a prayer away. So why is it that we humans are a bit like Jonah? That we call to people that God's grace is there and then get really uncomfortable when they, they, they come on, on and fall on God and, and call upon his grace. Why do we want to make the distance to the church bigger and bigger? Because Jonah was very happy with God raising up a plant to protect him from the sun. He was very happy with God saving him from the whale. But the Ninevites? Was Jonah wanting the Ninevites to jump through hoops, to crawl their way up the hill to get back to the church? And I wonder... If we humans do the same, do we create human things that make God so far away? If we believe that the church is the believers of God, that it is not a building, it is not a construction, but it is a group of people who have called on the name of the Lord and are saved, then, then why do we construct buildings on a hill and then put steps in place to kind of make people meet standards before they get there. While I was in Tahiti, I was trying to explain uh, to the women's ministries director there, who is a very wise, knowledgeable woman. She was a school principal for, for 40 years, now retired. I was trying to explain a story that I'd had in my, in my life, in my pastoral experience one day. I'd gone on a pastoral visitation because one of my church members was very distressed. And when I got there, I discovered a very large sin had been committed. I know you're going to be shocked, so brace yourself. Are you ready? The young people had taken, given out communion, wearing Hawaiian shirts. This is a very, very large... No, nope, I know, it's a serious matter, but maybe the board should have been called about. And so we had this lengthy discussion about whether young people should wear Hawaiian shirts. Now, I'm trying to explain this to one of my Tahitian friends who is wearing this lavishly bold dress with big Hawaiian swirls on them. And she's like, a what? And I said, yes, um, sometimes in Australia, people feel that people who are wearing things that are colourful with large flowers on them are only dressed to go to the beach. She was just completely flabbergasted that anybody would have a problem with this because in Tahiti, everybody wears stuff that looks Hawaiian all of the time. And in fact, they put Hawaiian stuff behind their ears as they come to church as a really good thing to do. But my dear friend in suburban Melbourne, 
I hope he never visits Tahiti because somebody might offer communion with a Hawaiian shirt. Yet as I spent time in Tahiti, I realised that there were things in Tahiti itself that people were getting upset about as well. In fact, when I go to the territory of Tahiti, the distance to the church sometimes is very far because everything that we present as a Seventh-day Adventist church to New Caledonia and to Tahiti is often in English. So what's the distance to the church for them? The barrier is language, to the point that now I've been making resources in French for the children's ministries and they get them and they're so precious that they don't want to use them. Because what, what, what if we don't ever get any more? What's the distance to the church? for my friends in Tahiti? What is the distance to the church for my friends in Melbourne? Because it seems to me that the issues might be different. But we all grapple with the idea that God is a prayer away. We all grapple to kind of understand how to even come to grips with this concept of God's grace. We human beings, we go from one extreme to the other. We either say... Right, we're going to argue about it until we have an intricate set of rules, as the Israelites did, right down to where to pin your hanky on Sabbath because you don't want to work by taking your hanky out of your pocket. So we'll pin it on. And then we need to discuss the distance of the pinning just to make sure we've got it right. Because if it's too far down here, if I pin down here, then it's definitely working to go this far to my nose. And I'm being serious. This is stuff that you can prove in... The, the, the writings of the Jewish culture about what they discussed back in the time of Jesus. So you had to pin it here because this is not a work, but this is a work. Right? We go to that extreme. We want to follow God and his grace so much that we get so caught up in doing it exactly right that we don't even blow our noses, literally. But on the other extreme, we kind of do this kind of fluffy, duffy grace that says, well, you do what you want and I'll do what I want and it'll be, it'll be right, mate. A bit kind of laid back Australian. Almost like a hippie colony sometimes. But surely grace is strong enough and big enough that if my brother walks down a road that would lead him to consequences that he could not bear, surely that I would go to my brother and say, brother, let me show you that God's grace is truth and it's justice and it's all done with graciousness and love. But we human beings, we're not very good at walking the middle road. We go from one extreme to the other. And at each extreme, I hear God's voice calling to us that he is only a prayer away. I want to tell you one final story to end today. It's a story about how the distance to the church was decreased by a small child who had the faith to believe that God would answer her prayers, where the adults in her life had given up hope. You see, little Lauren was born as a miracle of IVF. Her parents had had 19 goes of IVF before the hospital said, stop, don't go, don't come anymore, don't waste your money, this will never work for you. And with sad and broken hearts, Mark and Michelle, they gave up any opportunity to have children, decided that the adoption wasn't the road for them and were getting on with their lives. But 12 months later, the doctor called them and they said, look, we have a new experimental procedure. We think it might work for you. Why don't you try? Come in, give it a shot. So they tried, they came in and Michelle got pregnant. Um, and then she f was pushed over, fell over at church and um, had to spend a number of months lying down because she couldn't get up because they thought she was going to miscarry. And she finally got through that. And then they said there were markers for Down syndrome and they had to go through like the trauma of all of that. And they finally got through that. And so the doctor said, right, we're just going to put you in hospital and we're going to have a Caesar. But in the middle of the night, she went into labour. So the doctor got called in in the middle of the night and they did this emergency C-section and finally Lauren was born. 
And we were, as her church community, overjoyed for Mark and Michelle for the birth of this little beautiful girl. And poor Michelle was just so at the end of her exhaustion that she got shingles about two days after Lauren was born. Well, Lauren grew up a fine, happy and feisty young girl and going to a church where everybody else came from large families. Everybody in the church had at least four to six children. And so Lauren started saying, where are my brothers and sisters? And mum and dad who were wise, they were saying, Lauren, you know, it took a lot of work for us to get you and you were pretty special and so we're just going to leave it at that. And she's like, but why can't I have a brother or sister? And they, you know, they said... But Lauren didn't yet understand that what we adults do is make the distance to God really big. So every night she got down by her bed and she said, Dear God, please, 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 might I have a brother or a sister? And the persistent young prayer prayed day after day after day after day with so much discipline and fervour that her parents said, We have to do something. We need to do something to show this little girl that we have at least tried because what might happen to her faith or, you know. And so they decided that that what they would do is have one normal go of IVF, not the extra procedures that they had done to get Lauren. So they could explain to her and, and they could say that they tried but no brother and sister was hers. They had made the distance to God and his grace much bigger. And so they did one normal go of IVF, they got pregnant, they had a perfect pregnancy and now have two beautiful little girls. But it was the faith of their little girl that led to that miracle. Because she had not done the adult thing where um, she had collected a list of hurts and um, a list of failures and realised that it couldn't actually happen She put her faith in God that his grace was just a prayer away. And she prayed and she prayed and she prayed until the adults in her life had just a little bit of faith. And now she has one little sister. It is my prayer for us that we will have the faith of Lauren. On this day of a celebration of prayer, that we would remember that God's grace is good. It's deep. It's wide and it's big enough for us to navigate through life and that we would have that kind of faith to step forward and realise that God is amazing, to pray to him and to put our faith in him to look after us, to lead us and to take us home. I think we're going to end today by standing together and singing the hymn Amazing Grace. Would you stand with me as we sing this beautiful hymn?
Let's pray.